Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where it finally happened. They pushed their luck too far. The bottom has totally dropped out of D.C. Oh, my God. This is shocking. I mean, like, we all knew it was bad, but this is, like, really bad. So, yes, Blue Beetle opened lower than Shazam 2, which was already a significant drop from the first Shazam. Can you believe being like, uh, remember when our box office numbers were like Shazam? <laughs> Woo! Coming after the hugely disappointing openings of Shazam 2 and The Flash, one has to wonder uh, what Warner Brothers Discovery will do with their remaining pre-gun film, Aquaman 2. You can sure bet they're not going to spend a Barbie level of money advertising it, especially when they still have to do advertising campaigns this year for Dune 2, Wonka, and The Color Purple, although some of those films might move. Or might not. Although, what the heck are they going to do with Aquaman? Like, you know, just rip that Band-Aid off, Warner Brothers, right? Or, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think they can do the tax write-off thing more than once. Does anybody here want to see Aquaman 2? I feel bad because I really liked James Wan's work on the first film, but, I mean, we're just, like, treading water at this point, man, right? I mean, I, I guess I feel like every DC fan, I'll watch it. I, it just seems so pointless, right? Um, and speaking of spending money, have you seen any advertising for The Nun 2? It comes out September 8th. Did they spend all their budget? I mean, it was worth it to spend it on Barbie, quite frankly. But they're supposed to be able to afford to advertise more than one movie. So what went wrong with Blue Beetle? Who? Uh, I mean, I'm sure Zazzy is asking that question right now. He's like... I mean, he, he thought the gun and saffron were supposed to fix everything. He thought they'd be a magic bullet because he... Yoink! Stole them from Feige. If you can steal something from Feige, Feige, Feige probably doesn't want it. <laughs> Although Feige's not having a great time now either. But anyway, uh, I think, you know, some of it also, of course, falls on Zazzy as, as well, right? I mean, I think, you know, when you have a failure this big, everybody has to look inside. <laughs> now, I'm not, you don't necessarily have to get rid of anybody. I mean, I don't know if we're, we're at that point yet, but, you know, a discussion of what went wrong does, shouldn't be so scary that you're not willing to have it. We're going to have it right now. So obviously these pre-gun movies seem DOA, with Gun doing a soft reboot with Superman Legacy in 2025, which we all know is a bad idea. It should be a hard reboot, but he's insisting on the soft reboot because he wants to keep his pals. But because it's a soft reboot, he could keep other people as well. And, you know, he said maybe he'd keep Shazam because, you know, Zachary Levi is such good friends with James Gunn and particularly Peter Safran. But even there, he was like, well, let's see what the audience reaction is. But after Shazam 2 cratered and The Flash cratered, uh, Gunn was telling everybody who would listen that, oh, yes, uh, Jaime, uh, Jaime Reyes is Blue Beetle is the first member of his cinematic universe. But what's he going to do now? Why does Gunn keep making comments that he has to either walk back or awkwardly ignore, right? Like, because after this debut, nobody would blame him or expect him to keep Blue Beetle. You'd be like, you can't keep him. It, it just didn't work. But you know who's going to remember and be upset? The creatives on the film, who have been talking already about James, Gunn prom James Gunn's promises. They're going to be upset, and they're probably going to be very vocal about it. The But James Gunn Promised Me Club is getting awfully big. And you know, he can, it can only have members by people that he lets into the club. So stop making promises to people. It's just, it's like he needs an intervention or they should stop letting him have meetings. It's nuts. All right, so also remember that Blue Beetle was originally supposed to be a streaming film on HBO Max back in the day when that was still a thing. Yet after it tested so well, Warner Brothers was like, let's put this in theaters. However, audiences decided based on the very limited ad campaign for the film. You know, we're going to talk about the studios and Hollywood blaming the lack of actors doing publicity in a moment, like they can blame that all they want. They're like, oh, the actors aren't there. How could anyone know about my movie? But you're like, nah, I think you could find a way. I mean, the lack of posters for Blue Beetle, I found shocking. As I discussed in my spoiler review, how did they not have character posters for this film? It has such a, a cast of so much personality. They should each have character posters for sure. And those photos, by the way, are supposed to be taken when you're on set 
with everyone in full costume and makeup. So there's no excuse. You know, you can't be like, oh, well, you know, the actor strike came, so we couldn't do it. They knew the actor strike was coming. There was a 12-day extension. They could have had the whole blue, I mean, they were so Barbie-centric, maybe that's what happened. But they could have had the whole blue Beetle cast come in and go, quick, we got to take posters and those, those, that video for those moving posters that they have at malls and stuff. And they could have done it. They could have, they could have, they could have done it. I mean, all the movies that are complaining now that didn't, um, that didn't put in the can some pre-recorded stuff. I mean, Haunted Mansion had some pre-recorded stuff and that didn't help them. And they had character posters and that didn't help them either. So it's, you know, it's not, this is, that's not another magic bullet. Um, but I mean, you, it, at least it would have been nice to know that Warner Brothers had done everything they could to advertise the film. But based on the advertising campaign that they did run, audiences saw it and decided, yeah, that's a streaming movie. With many were just waiting to either watch it on digital or for no extra cost down the line on Max. Flash, Flash did pretty well on digital, and it has its Max date fast approaching. Uh, has DC turned itself into Pixar, by the way? Like, wow, you know, streaming, we've been talking about it for the past few weeks, but streaming really did not work out for Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, it just turned out to be just an awful, awful, forget Pandora's box, it's, that, it's, it's the arc from Raiders melting everybody's face off. All right, so then with the ad campaign that the movie did run, they decided to lean very hard into the importance of representation. From director Angel uh, Manuel Soto's comments that were sometimes a little aggressive, to open letters from the Latino, uh, from, uh, Latino entertainment groups, right, being like, this, it's so important that this movie succeed. That's even how Zack Snyder framed his tweet about the importance of representation and beyond. Really strong focus on representation. But you know, it worked for Crazy Rich Asians. Oh, wait a minute. Exact same opening weekend. Oh, news. <laughs> you know, why don't they look at that? Why don't they be like, wait a minute. How do films targeted at a specific demographic, how do they do at the box office? Maybe, maybe we should look it up. Because that's exactly what they got. Only Crazy Rich Asians was made for just $30 million. So they were doing a happy dance with that opening. Well, you know, Blue Beetle, while cheap for a superhero movie, was $100 million. Uh, so thankfully, though, Latino audiences did show up. Sometimes Latino audiences don't show up. Latino audiences have become a huge power base within movie going overall. They, they supercharge a lot of movies these days. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure out how to target them specifically. Horror has had a very hard time figuring it out. But Latino audiences showed up for Blue Beetle, which is fantastic. But not enough of them did. And not enough other demographics showed up. Perhaps at the end of the day, Warner Brothers ended up making Blue Beetle seem niche rather than a four-quadrant superhero movie. Something to think about going forward. You know, it's the pendulum effect. No representation to maybe, like, leaning too much into it. And I, I thought the representation in Blue Beetle was fantastic, but something's not working from a business perspective. Now, I think what really has to be keeping James Gunn up at night if he's at all self-aware, and I'm not sure that he is, but, I mean, this is so obvious, he's got to be sweating bullets over it. And maybe Peter Safran? Peter Safran is far enough away from this that he's like, I'm just going to keep making movies forever, whatever. I mean, he's a full-on producer on Blue Beetle. But anyway, it's that these movies are good. I thought, I think, you know, I think they're solid. I think some of them are better than solid. I enjoyed Shazam too. I thought The Flash was excellent. And I really like Blue Beetle. Blue Beetle even has not only solid audience scores, but a solid RT score. They're certainly better than a lot of the content that Marvel has been putting out recently. Yet Marvel's audience is still holding on, although for how long? Watch out, Feige, this could be you. Uh, but DC seems to have finally pushed their audience to the breaking point. You know, it's interesting. Marvel has yet to totally lose their audience. Even Star Wars never totally lost its audience. They called an audible after they had a billion dollar movie because they were like, oh, this is getting bad. Let's, let's take a break. Uh, but I, I think we've yet, I mean, Transformers, I mean, I think we've seen smaller franchises kind of totally lose their audience. You know, uh, it was just reported this weekend that uh, Rise of the Beasts is like, I think even lower than, than Bumblebee. But like this, it's, it's unusual for a franchise this big with this kind of history to sink this low. As I said, the bottom has fallen out. And I think it's, it's very, very scary. Because it's never happened before. DC's, DC's going blind here on how to try and fix it. How are they going to get the audience back? Although I think the continued drama, thanks to Gunn, certainly doesn't help. And I continue to believe that joining DC seems to curse everybody. It's, it's, a, it's incredible. It's almost like the brand is cursed because things happen to it that are so shocking. 
The Hollywood trades, as I said, are starting to argue that the SAG strike, which is keeping actors from promoting films and television, is finally hurting box office. They're like, it's the actors, right? Because letting Zachary Levi uh, talk uh, about Shazam 2 was such a gift to that movie. <laughs> they were like, if only he had been on strike then. He's still causing problems, even during the strike, just when he talks in general. I mean, actors, you never know what you're going to get, quite frankly, when they do PR. But, I mean, honestly, the trades are saying that maybe the grosses are off by about 15%, which does sound about right to me, and it's not a huge number. You know, it's not like, oh, my God. I mean, it's, it's enough to feel it, but it's not devastating, right? Like, it wouldn't, these movies, like, you know, Blue Beetle wouldn't have doubled its box office if Sholo Maraduena had been able to walk the blue carpet. Uh, but also, it's important to remember that this is how strikes work. They're supposed to hurt, to incentivize the powers that are withholding to end the strike. There, I mean, there are no really big movies until November, quite frankly, and word is that the strikes probably will be over by then because they are starting to really hurt. I mean, they're really pushing to end the writer's strike, which could be ended maybe by, by or around Labor Day, and then I think they'll set their sights on the actor strike, and this could be wrapped up by November for those big movies. Uh, so I, th I think that's one of the reasons that Warner Brothers hasn't blinked yet with something like Dune 2. Uh, so what's the latest on Barbenheimer, right? Barbenheimer! Well, Barbie is a very close number two this uh, weekend in her fifth weekend of release. And in the next few days, she will surpass Super Mario Brothers to become the highest grossing domestic film of 2023. And she might be able to do it worldwide as well. There's only about a $100 million, diff $100 million uh, dollar difference between them globally. So Barbie, especially with so little competition, I think Barbie, uh, you know, I was going to say that both Super Mario Brothers and Barbie did so well in part thanks to lack of competition, kind of gimmies from Hollywood. But that's not totally true with Barbie. I mean, it's helped certainly in the weeks after Barbenheimer, but Oppenheimer was big competition. I mean, they did feed off of each other, but that was another big movie in the same space. So I think, you know, I don't want to detract from Barbie's success by saying she had no competition, because she did, Oppenheimer. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, 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 you, it is the lack of competition does have to be kind of looked at for these for Barbie and Super Mario Brothers as well. So how is Oppie doing? Well, he's chugging along as well. He is the sixth highest grossing film of the year domestic and the, and the fifth worldwide. He just passed 700 million, but I still feel pretty good about my 800 million ceiling. Uh, maybe I'd raise it to 850. Now, some of you, when I said that before, some of you were like, no way, Grace, going to end with a nine in front of it. I don't think that's true. I, I, I'll meet you in the middle and say maybe an eight, but I still feel good about this ending somewhere with a, with a seven in front of it. But who cares? That'll still make it Nolan's uh, biggest grossing film outside of his two big Batman movies. Now the question is, well, obviously we all want to know if he'll get Bond, but I think another burning question is whether or not he'll go back to Warner Brothers. They really want him back. They say, hey, we got new leadership. We got new, and there's a new manager. <laughs> Nolan did not like the Warner Brothers manager. I'd like to see your manager. But they're like, we got new management. They sent him a check for a couple million dollars, tens of million dollars. It wasn't a payoff. It was what he, it was, it was the makeup money on Tenet, right? Uh, and he's like, oh, he's been mixing his sound here at Warner Brothers. Oh, that's, is he coming back, right? I don't know if he is. I think, I think uh, Nolan did not like having to open opposite Barbie. She, you know, as I said, the, the, the shade from that pink mushroom cloud ended up being pretty intense. Uh, so I think, I think that hurt him. I think that's just another thing that he doesn't like about what Warner Brothers did to him. And I think he's now proven that he works at any studio. You know, before it might have been, ah, oh, only Warner Brothers gets you, Nolan. Only Warner Brothers knows how to release your movies. Well, it's proven that Universal can do it. And if Universal can do it, probably someone else can too. If I were Bob Iger, I'd be like, how'd you like to come make a, I don't know, you want to make a Fox movie? Right? James Cameron's very happy over here. I mean, I didn't even like Oppenheimer, and if I were a studio head, I would be on the phone to Nolan. Well, I'd call, he doesn't apparently use a phone. So I'd call his wife, producer, and say, hand the phone to Chris, because he brings in a lot of money. He is the star. Uh, so that, that's really interesting. But again, we'll see, also, um, we'll see if he gets, uh, if he's, I don't know if he's, Bond is also a very big star, and his comments about wanting full creative control I mean, he's never going to get that, but, you know, maybe that's just his opening negotiating stance. I'd, I would like to see him get Bond, especially after this box office. I think Bond, it, you know, that would really go a long way to ensuring the transition to the new Bond went well. Uh, what would you like to see Christopher Nolan do next? And if you were him, would you go back to Warner Brothers? And if not, to which studio would you like to see Nolan go? 
You could be, some of you will probably be like, why doesn't he release his own movie, Grace? Nolan's got enough to do. He doesn't need to deal with that. You need a whole machine set up to release a film. I mean, you know, you know, Nolan just wants to have whims of fancy. He's like, I'd like to do an IMAX film that's a print that's 11 miles long and weighs 600 pounds. And then he just walks away and makes everyone else figure out how to make that happen. That's the beauty of being in the, uh, uh, with the studios. All right, so anyway, as for the rest of the top 10, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is doing, still doing pretty good in its third weekend, able to hold off Universal Strays, which just debuted. Another B-movie misfire after a string of solid hits. Ooh, has Universal lost their B-movie mojo? Because as you can see, The Last Voyage of the Demeter dropped 62% in just its second weekend and is already almost out of the top 10. I mean, like, wow, it is at the bottom. Uh, Gran Turismo and Equalizer 3 are the only movies left this summer, and, we, and they will have no actors to promote them, so we'll test that theory. Uh, I haven't seen Equalizer 3 yet, but I saw Gran Turismo. You can check out my review. It's already up. That's a good movie. Uh, although, again, does it need to be seen in a theater? I appreciated seeing it in, a, in, a, in Dolby on a big screen. Uh, so we'll see how they fare, right? But you're basically, with these two movies, looking at the theatrical playing field for the next couple of weeks. And all these films will work to soak up as much summer cash as they can, you know, before uh, fall hits. Are there any movies, or are there any movies here that you're still hoping to try and see in theaters before summer ends? Or are you done? Are you wrapped? Are you like, I'm done? Because, you know, you're getting ready for uh, work and school, and a lot of schools actually already started, which is nuts. All right, anyway, over on streaming, Suits is still dominating. Still, not only is Suits so big, but there's nothing else that's been introduced to challenge it. Again, it's a, again kudos to Suits, but it's kind of a gimme. Uh, Bluey is there still uh, right behind it, and Netflix is Sweet Magnolias. But those are two acquired shows. It's so slow right now that viewers are going back to old shows for entertainment. Look at NCIS, how high up that is. That's nuts. People are watching... Old CBS television. That's the oldest of the old. Also, Puss in, although I do love The Amazing Race. All right, so anyway, and Puss in Boots 2 hit Netflix. And while that did such big business, uh, it did well in theaters, and then it did very well on digital, and then it was a juggernaut on Peacock, but there's still gas left in the tank, as now that it's on Netflix, it's still doing well. What a movie. Totally deserves it. I love that film. Uh, with original, Secret Invasion is still struggling, but at least it's still in the top 10. Uh, while The Bear, with Hulu using Netflix's binge model, it's still in the top 10 even after weeks, a couple of weeks, so that's really encouraging. Uh, with movies on the movies charts, there's Puss in Boots 2 at the top, while Netflix has three new original movies right behind it, with only solid numbers, but at least it's got a good little block there. And look, Moana and Encanto are both in the top 10 again. All is right with the world. Uh, then on Netflix, uh, Netflix's charts for just last week, Heart of Stone is the number one movie. Although it's not quite as strong as Extraction 2 and the Mother's debuts earlier this year. And they're all basically the same movie. Uh, although I think I didn't see, I've only seen Extraction 2. Although it would be very hard for, I think, anything to be as good as Extraction 2. That was really phenomenal. But this is like a, you know, speaking of uh, assembly lines, just like Universal has their B-movie assembly line, Netflix definitely has an action movie assembly line. And while Heart of Stone is a scooch below those two movies, it's still in the same ballpark. So, uh, so far, so good. But, you know, uh, Extraction 2 and The Mother held up for weeks. They, they had very strong holds. And we'll see how uh, Heart of Stone does over the next couple of weeks. With shows... What do you know? Painkiller is a soft, it's a soft number one, but number one is number one. And that's pretty good considering it's basically a redo of Dope Sick from a few years ago. I think the distance helps. But I said last week, I was like, how is anybody going to watch Painkiller, right, when they already watched Dope Sick? Well, there's so little to watch right now. I caved and watched Painkiller, especially because my parents were like, we're loving Painkiller. Although, to be fair, my parents didn't finish Dope Sick. I finished Dope Sick. I really liked it. But I got to tell you, I really like Painkiller as well. And it's kind of like done from a different perspective. It's also a little edgier. So I think you can watch both. But I, I so I liked Painkiller. I think it's good. I'm actually going to finish it probably today. Uh, this reminds me of what happened with Candy and Love and Death. Although nobody watched Love and Death, which is too bad because it was so good. And I, I didn't watch Candy, but from the clips that I saw for comparison, Love and Death was so much better. Whereas I feel Painkiller and Dope Sick are more even in, in, in terms of quality. Although... Well, well, we'll see. Will awards even take a look at Painkiller, considering how many awards Dope Sick won? We'll see. But at least Painkiller has an audience. Uh, and it's and it's first and it's first full week on the charts. Heartstopper season two has unfortunately fallen a bit instead of go gone up, but it's still towards the top of the top ten, so that's good. 
And on iTunes, I told you no hard feelings would thrive on digital. Just wait till it hits Netflix. It's going to explode on Netflix. Uh, that'll be in probably a, um, about a month. But it's going to do very well on Netflix. But it's already doing very well on digital. We did the BTT Movie Club Watch Along with No Hard Feelings on Friday, and the movie was not only very funny, but surprisingly sweet. And not as raunchy as everyone says. I mean, it has that one scene, but even that wasn't that bad. I mean, I think it's, it's more, I think, a very sweet film. By the way, speaking of watch-alongs, mark your calendars. As I tweeted the other day, we'll be doing a Barbie watch-along the day the movie drops on digital, uh, September 5th, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And for this watch along, all BTT subscribers, if you're subscribed to BTT, you will be able to participate in the watch along with your own copy of the film. And all members at any level will be able to comment. So that's gonna be so fun. And the watch along, by the way, will stay up if you can't join live for, again, subscribers. All right, so back to iTunes' charts. Elemental is also doing well, but I suspect a lot of people are, are waiting even still it's for it to hit Disney Plus at no extra cost. Uh, you know, because, uh, well, I guess, you know, No Hard Feelings will hit I uh, uh, I mean, uh, Netflix at no extra cost. But I think that isn't quite as ingrained as, like, waiting, just waiting for hit di to hit Disney Plus. Which is another problem with Disney Plus in particular. They did too good a job marketing it. And that Gerard Butler is a B-movie machine. Again, another assembly line with his latest, once again, posting solid numbers. I haven't seen this one, but did you see Plane? Plane was actually really great. And while Cobweb with Lizzie Kaplan and Homelander has fallen substantially, it's still in the top 10 in its second week uh, on digital. I think if only this, I mean, it's kind of slow right now, so that maybe helped it. But I think if it had waited until September or closer to Halloween, I mean, I think it maybe would have done even better. Uh, as for this coming week, yes, Gran Turismo, after a slight delay and lots of fan screenings, we'll see if they helped. They certainly didn't help The Flash. That will finally open wide this Friday. So be, again, be sure to check out my review, link below. Uh, awards contender Golda also opens, and Liam Neeson has yet another thriller. His assembly line, I think, uh, has been going on for too long. There's also a movie called Bottoms, a comedy that's been in the can for about a year, but is now finally being released, and stars the Bears, Ayo Edebiri, Red, White, and Blue's Nicholas Galitzine, and Sidney Crawford's daughter. What an interesting grouping. As for streaming movies, uh, who, there's no, uh, no big movies hit uh, iTunes uh, this week, but uh, as uh, Indiana Jones is the week after. Now, as for streaming movies, Hulu has Vacation Friends 2. That got a sequel. And, you know, I got to say, I have, I have a lot of respect for John Cena for coming back for that sequel. I mean, I'm sure he got paid. But he could have been like, I don't know if I want to do a sequel to a streaming movie. But that John Cena, that's also an assembly line. Then, well, uh, Netflix, they have You Are So Not Invited to My uh, Bat Mitzvah, which is an Adam Sandler movie where this time he's trying to launch an acting career for his daughter. In fact, both daughters are in this movie. It's a Nepo baby movie. But you know what? There was surprisingly little, really little backlash when the trailer came out. People actually seem to react very well to the trailer. So this could actually do quite well. Uh, then with shows tonight, MGM Plus, where's that? MGM Plus debuts the UK's latest take on the King, on the King Arthur legend with the Winter King. I think one of you was actually mentioning this to me the other day, which is why I included it here. Well, on Tuesday night, Disney Plus, ooh, Disney Plus is finally dropping their shows at a regular time uh, for, uh, for, well, sorry, the rest of the world's actually kind of upset about this. But for uh, North America, it drops HBO time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesday night, which is a little bit like what um, Amazon does. You know, they drop their Friday shows on Thursday nights. You know, with the boys, for instance, they would do that uh, at 8. But... Uh, Disney Plus is going for the HBO drop time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific, for, with Ahsoka with the first two episodes, which make for a nice little movie. So that's, that's amazing. So we'll see if the, the new uh, drop, the new uh, time for dropping the shows, if that helps them on social media and in viewership, two places that Disney Plus has really been hurting. I've been screaming at them to do a different drop time, and they're finally doing it. Although... I'm not sure if Ahsoka is, is quite the show to do it with. You know, the embargo, the review embargo lifts on Tuesday morning, uh, like, like around noon. So be sure to check out my review, my non-spoiler review. And then that very evening when the episodes drop, I'll uh, be sure to also circle back for my breakdowns. I'll catch you up with all the Rebels stuff. If you didn't watch Rebels, it's going to be hard for you. Uh, then on Wednesday, Apple TV starts season two of Invasion. And on Thursday, Netflix, ha Netflix has season three of Ragnarok. 
So that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what are your thoughts on Blue Beetle's box office and what it means for DC? Again, no one has ever been this low. So how did they get out of it? Got any ideas for them? Share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.